every bondage and stronghold. Those who are dealing with depression, oppression, suicidal thoughts. I, devil, I bind you in the name of Jesus. You loose those people right now in Jesus' mighty name. And we loose life. Right now, we loose life in their life. The life of God, the Zoe life. The, the God kind of life. Hallelujah. Power. We have been called to power. We have been called to authority as the body of Christ. We need to rise up and stop the devil. Stop the demons in their tracks in the name of Jesus. We have been called to power and authority. Jesus has given us that. Amen? Come on. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Just kind of keeping this atmosphere. I'm not in a hurry. I'm not in a hurry. You know, it's interesting. Jesus told uh, 500 people. He said, you go to Jerusalem and wait. Just kind of hang out in this upper room. Kind of just get into prayer. Don't be in a hurry because I'm going to send my Holy Spirit with power and authority. It's going to come in your life. Now, you don't have to wait for the Holy Spirit baptism. But man, there's something about when his presence is flowing of just waiting on him. You, go ahead. You may be seated. Just get relaxed here real quick. But stay in this atmosphere of worship. Close your eyes. Just kind of just focus on him. There's something about just waiting on him. Oh, Holy Spirit, we need you to move. Continue to move. See, there's... A lot, there's people who come into this building, who step foot on this property, and their life is a wreck. It's a mess. Amen? And the Holy Spirit says, look, I want to change that. I want to shift some things in your life. Amen? That's why we come and gather for his presence to come to minister to us so we can change some things. And we can let him in. Let the Holy Spirit in to your life. See, oh, I just had a vision of a heart, and the heart is like just congested, just so many things going on in your life. And the Lord says, is there any room for me? Ooh. Is there any room for me? Make room for me, says the Lord. Make room for me, for my word, for my presence, because out of that heart flow the issues of life. Think about that. Every part of our life. See, that's why I always say the New Testament is, see, the Old Testament was about works and ceremonies and things to do. And, but, but the New Testament, it's about your heart. The Lord wants your heart. Think about that. Ooh. See, if he wants your heart, he wants to change your life. Because if your heart changes, your life changes. Amen. So, Lord, right now, I pray that as we continue this service, as I bring forth the word, I pray right now that a spirit of wisdom and revelation would be loosed upon every person. I, I release a spirit. Here, listen to this. I release a spirit of breakthrough in their life. In the name of Jesus. May this, Lord, whatever their perception is that they have about you, that they have about your word, that they, they have about the Christian life, Lord, whatever misconceptions they have, I pray it would be blown apart with the Holy Ghost bomb today. Yes. Revelation knowledge. Yes. Let revelation pop in them as I preach your word, Lord God. In Jesus' name, and Lord God, yeah, Lord God, your word says that you send forth your holy angels to minister to and for the ears of salvation. So, Lord, we release right now everything associated with the kingdom of God, including your holy angels. Come on. Your holy ministering spirits into this place to minister to each person. Mm, glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing already. Woo! If you have your Bibles, open them up to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, I have a powerful word that I want to share today. It's been burning in me. I know the last couple of weeks I've done the manifestations of the, of the Holy Spirit, part one and part two. And 
and this has been burning in me for a couple weeks, so I've been rearing and ready to go to release this word. But I know I had to finish about the gifts of the Spirit. Like Stacy said, there is. The Holy Spirit is trying to train us. He's preparing us. Amen? Amen. And this is all part of that puzzle. John uh, chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. Mm. Jesus said these words, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you. See, if there's a joy problem in your life, there's a short circuit. Amen? And that your joy may be half full. What does it say? Full. Full, full tank. This is my commandment that I, uh, that you, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Are you a friend of God this morning? No longer do I call you servants. Oh, here's a revelation we have to hold on. No longer do I call you servants. I'll talk about that later. For a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I have chose you and appointed you. <laughs> Whew, that's rich right there. That I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the father in my name He may give it you these things. I command you that you love one another So the last couple of weeks like I said, this has been burning in me it burning in my spirit And there's two words that have been burning in my spirit. So hot say hot, hot. Here it is radical prayer Radical prayer. The Holy Spirit is wanting us to go deeper and be radical in our prayer life. He wants us to go beyond the shallow prayers. This is time to go deeper and be radical in our prayer life. Amen? Amen. Many Christians uh, think that their prayers don't matter and that they don't make a difference because after all, God doesn't need me, little old me, right? He doesn't need me. He will do whatever he wants anytime he wants. That is a lie from the pits of hell. Why would the Holy Spirit prompt you and I to pray if it didn't matter? What, right? I mean, wouldn't that be a waste of the Holy Spirit's time? Surely the Holy Spirit's busy enough to do other things than to prompt me, James, pray right now about this if it didn't matter. You see, the Holy Ghost does not waste his energy. The Holy Spirit does not waste time. Are you hearing me? We might, but he doesn't. The Word of God has much to say about prayer. And without prayer, listen, the kingdom of God is not advanced. Without prayer, people would not be getting saved or healed. Without prayer, miracle signs and wonders wouldn't be taking place on this earth. Are you following me? Here's what prayer is. Here it is. Let's just put this in a little nutshell for you. Prayer is a holy invitation from the Holy Spirit, or to the Holy Spirit, rather, to invade earth. Prayer is a holy invitation. That's all prayer is. It's an invitation. It's an invitation to the Holy Spirit to invade our life, to invade another person's life or a place. Are you following me? Our Heavenly Father needs His people to pray to give His kingdom access on this earth. If we're not praying, the kingdom of God is being hindered. So does He need you? Does He need me? Does He need our prayers? Absolutely. More than you and I even realize. Your words, your prayers are powerful and they have eternal consequences. And our lack of prayer also has eternal consequences. See, 
many Christians are discouraged in their prayer life right now. Because in their mind, listen to me, I got to say this, in their mind, God has let them down somewhere down the line in their life. God, why did you let this happen, right? Let's just get to the nitty gritty of things, right? There, there, let's just say this. There's some people, uh, it's wild, but it's right. Some people are holding unforgiveness toward God for something he did not even do. How do, you, how do you like it when you are falsely accused of something? Do you like that? Have you ever been falsely accused of something? Man, I have. I'm like, what are you talking about? You don't even know me. You're going to listen to someone who doesn't even know me, right? I don't like being falsely accused, and either does your heavenly father. I always say it like this. Our heavenly father is not a child abuser. You got to understand this, that God is for you. He's not against you. God did not let you down. Listen, and even God's no's or God's not yet's, he's protecting us. How many, listen, if we got everything we prayed for, let's, let's face it, a lot of our prayers are fleshly, right? Right? Come on, God, let me hit the big one. Let me, you know, let me win millions, right? How fleshly is that? You know what? God won't let you because he knows you'll go down a road that would bring you in the pits of hell for eternity. Right. Are you following me? Yeah. See, God sees ahead. God sees ahead. He knows. He knows the traps, pits, and snares. He knows that. So even God's knows or not yet are a blessing. See, that's where we got to have a spiritual mindset on these things. And it all comes down to this, trusting your heavenly father. Many of you don't trust your heavenly father because you've had a terrible father in an earthly sense. Are you hearing me? Some of you are basing who God is based on your earthly parents. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. You can put all your hope, all your faith, and all your trust in your heavenly father. Here's a faith lesson, faith 101 lesson. Ready? Never base your faith on experiences in your life. Because if something negative happens, now you just exalted the experience above the word of God, above your heavenly father, and you're falsely accusing him. You're falsely accusing him. So you can never base an experience uh, do not base your faith on experience. Don't do it. It's a trap from the pits of hell, and it'll lead you down a wrong slope. And you'll, I guarantee you, if you do that, you're backslidden. Anybody who's done that, you are backslidden right now. You following me? And you're falsely accusing God for something he had no part in. And, and truth be told, let's face it. Let's just be honest. Let's let Pastor James say the brutal truth this morning. It's usually us not following the instructions in the word of God, right? right? It's us getting in the flesh or, or it's the enemy coming in to cause havoc in your life, yep. right? It's either us or the enemy. Yep. And, and if it's the enemy, chances are we've opened the door and said, come on in devil, right? Right? Yep. It's not God. God has great plans for you. God has great plans for me. All right? So stop blaming God. Now, for us to go deeper and get radical in our prayer life, there needs to be some foundational truths from the Word of God settled in our heart. Um, so the first foundation I want to show you is found in John 17. Go there with me. John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23 here. This is a powerful truth that we really need to latch on to. And if you don't know this truth, you're going to be one that blames God. All right? You're going to be one that blames God if you don't have this foundational truth. John 17, 20 through 23, Jesus said this, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe me uh, through their word, that they may all be one, or in unity, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Notice the word us is capitalized. That's talking about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all right? For those who are just Jesus only, well, the word talks about the Trinity, right? That the world may believe that you sent me, and that the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be, may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know 
that you have sent me, here it is, and have loved them, he's talking about us, as you have loved me. Here's the foundational truth. If you don't have this foundational truth, you're toast. That your heavenly father loves you as much as he loves his son Jesus. Wow. I mean, just that one truth alone, that should make your face skyrocket. That should be a revelation bomb going off in your spirit right now. I mean, are you kidding me? As much as he loves Jesus? What? And Jesus said this. Jesus said, the glory which you gave me, I gave to the church. What? Are you kidding me? Listen, this is what I'm saying. I always say it, that we don't have to live as the world lives down here. We, we have the opportunity to live up here in a greater level, but we settle for this because we bought dead religious lies. Whew, are you hearing me? I was watching Daystar the other day, and, and someone was saying, uh, on a, someone said, was talking to God, you know, in their prayer life, and they said, well, God, people don't like Christianity. He said they don't like dead Christianity. Are you following me? Yeah. Is someone who's walking in the power of God and doing the works of Jesus on this earth and boldness, walking that authority, I guarantee you we will get people knocking these doors down to get in this building and say, what must I do to be saved? Right. Are you hearing me? Yeah. People, it's not about Christianity alone. It's dead Christianity. Right. People have been fed a whole bunch of junk. Right. Are you hearing me? In the body of Christ. We need the full word of God. Now, uh, so Jesus prayed to his heavenly father. Uh, you have loved them as you have loved me. Because of that, we can have radical faith. We can be, have radical prayers. Are you following me? The Holy Spirit was showing me that many Christians are in bondage. Here we go. Ready for this? The Holy Spirit was showing me that many Christians are in bondage to a spirit of rejection in prayer, in their prayer life. A spirit of rejection in their prayer life. And it manifests in different ways. Here's how. They're afraid to be let down. Well, if I ask for that, you know, what if I don't get, you know, what? I, right? They're afraid to be let down. They're afraid to look like a failure to other people. In that God doesn't need them. These are, this is the, that spirit of rejection that's, in, in, again, a spirit of rejection. What's the goal? Trying to get you and I not to pray. That's the goal. You know, if there's so much, you would think we'd just use common sense on this. If there's so much um, hindrance, if there's, you know, where the enemy's coming against us when we try to pray. Boy, you would think we would say, wow, if the enemy's trying to stop me. This must be pretty powerful, right? Instead of falling into the pits, traps, and snares, it should make you want to pray even more. Glory to God. So spirit of rejection has attacked the body of Christ, all right? And those reasons are lies from the devil because Jesus made it very clear that our heavenly Father loves us just as much as he loves Jesus. I love how Jesus, it says, went to the mountain sometimes all night to pray to his heavenly father. See, Jesus had a revelation of his father's love for him. Do you have a revelation of your father's love? If it does, it'll manifest in your fellowship with him. See, we don't want to make prayer mechanical. You understand what I'm saying? It's not a mechanical thing. It should, be, it should be come out of your intimacy with your heavenly father, that relationship with him. Amen? Now, I want to show you a powerful revelation here uh, that the Holy Spirit revealed to me. You know, when we read the Word of God about Jesus' powerful prayer life and doing miracles, signs, and wonders, right? How many have you heard Christians say, and maybe you've even said it yourself sometime down the line, where he says, well, that was Jesus. Right. Have you ever heard anyone say that? Oh, that was Jesus, right? Oh, let me, let me slay this sacred cow now, all right? We better put some tarps out here. It's going to get a little messy, all right? But listen to this. I always point out in, about Jesus' earthly ministry this, that Jesus ministered as a man anointed with the Holy Spirit just like us. You following me? Jesus was our example. We are a part of his body on this earth. 
If we're members of his body, we're connected with him. Are you, we're connected to him. Amen? Now, here's the powerful revelation that just changed my, my whole outlook on, on ministry and life. And, and I want to share it with you today. You ready for this? The Holy Spirit told me this a while back. He said this, meditate on the humanity of Jesus. Meditate, think on, find scriptures in the word that talks about the humanity side of Jesus. Now, let me, let me go a little deeper in this because I got deer in the headlight stairs on this, okay? Here's what we got. Jesus said the works that he did, we would do also. John 14, 12, right? And greater works because he was going unto the Father, right? And he would send the Holy Spirit. Now, here's what, what, the, what the Holy Spirit showed me. That those that are caught up in dead religion, that believe that we cannot walk in the power of God, what do they, they're the ones that say this, that was Jesus. And they say it in a way of like, you're never going to walk in that power and authority. Are you following me? You're never going to, they say it in, in, in kind of a snooty way, you're never going to walk that way, right? You're not going to walk in that power. But though, this is what the Holy Spirit said. He said, those that are focused in, on dead religion, their focus is only on the divinity side of Jesus and not the humanity side. Now, Jesus was the God-man. You understand that, right? Fully God, fully man, right? I'm not taking anything away from Jesus, obviously, right? But those in dead religion take out that humanity side. Now, I've always taught, you got, listen to this. I mean, I've always saw, when I, when I would study about cults and, and false religions, usually, right, they take that divinity side that Jesus was just a good man, right? But let me show you something powerful. Satan and evil spirits want us as the body of Christ to ignore the humanity side. Go with me. I'm going to prove it to you here. Go to 1 John chapter 4. I'm going to show you something. You probably have never seen this before. I'm going to take a shot in the dark and say that. Now, this is powerful. The Holy Spirit told me, meditate and study the humanity side of Jesus. Because when we do, now it brings Jesus a little closer to us walking on this earth and ministering under that anointing and power of the Holy Spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit told me this. Now, 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Let's take a look at this. I'm going to prove to you that Satan and evil spirits want us, the body of Christ, to ignore the humanity side of Jesus. Here it is. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Here it is. Every spirit that confesses or agrees with that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess or agree that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is already in the world. See, Jesus, when he came in this earthly ministry, he came as the spotless and sinless Lamb of God. He condemned sin in the flesh. He had to be like us. He had to be like us and overcome sin. If he wasn't human, if he didn't have a humanity side, it, it, we wouldn't be saved. Are you following me? So testing the spirits here depends on whether they confess or agree that Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, the chosen one of God, has come in the flesh, the humanity side of Jesus. Are you following me? The devil wants, wants to not admit that because that was the enemy's defeat because Jesus did come as a human. He had an earthly mom, Mary, but his daddy was Father God. That's the divinity side and the humanity side. But in connection to ministering on this earth, the Holy Spirit said, take a look at the humanity side of Jesus. If Jesus did it, you can do it. Yes. Are you following me? Yes. Jesus said, the works that I've done, you're going to do also. So this is totally scriptural here. Listen to this. A spirit of antichrist does not want to confess it. We're not talking about 
the Antichrist that's going to show up on the scene and promise peace. This is a spirit, a demon of Antichrist. Are you following me? There is going to be an Antichrist that shows up on the scene, but this is talking about the demon or spirit of Antichrist. So an Antichrist spirit does not want to confess that because Jesus had to come as a man. He, Jesus is called the second Adam to reverse the curse of what the first Adam did. Are you following me? So a person, listen to this, the Holy Spirit showed me this, a person that denies that we can do the works that Jesus did is in bondage to a spirit of Antichrist. You following that? My, my, my. Now you can see why the enemy doesn't want you to meditate and understand the humanity side of Jesus. I mean, it, you know, you, you look through when Lazarus died, right? It said that Jesus wept. He had a humanity side. Like I said, he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the death, but he still cried. He still connected with the earthly emotions of us. Amen? Amen. The humanity side. That fact alone should make your faith skyrocket and go deeper in your prayer life. Radical faith will manifest radical prayer. Amen? Amen. Ask, start asking your Heavenly Father for miracles, signs, and wonders in your, you know, in your life. Uh, pray for divine appointments in your life. Amen? Amen. Uh, pray for the gifts of the Spirit to be active in your life. I mean, really throw the rope out there. Throw the anchor out there. Come on, don't hold back. We got to get beyond this shallow thing. And, and, and what about raising the dead? How's the dead going to be raised unless we pray for the dead to be raised? Now that's, the, right? I mean, I touch on that. I'm just saying, we have to do something. We, we, we have to throw that anchor out there, man. That net there, thank you. That net. And start pulling in the supernatural in our life. All right? Um. So step out in faith and let's get out of our, our comfort zone boat and watch the Holy Spirit move in power in our life, all right? Start praying for people in person. Start praying for people over the phone, amen? amen. It's time for us to get radical. When you're at church, you know, go up to someone and say, you know, hey, can I pray for you today? Right here, do it in church, right? Let me pray for you right now. Step out, you know, pray for people in wheelchairs, Pray for people who are on crutches. Step out. We're not going to see the miracles unless we step out and start praying and, and, and walking in that authority. Amen? Amen? So John 17 verse 20 points out that Jesus was not just praying for those at the time that he was praying there, but for all those who would believe after in the future. And this shows a powerful point about prayer. Are you ready for this? True, faith-filled, sincere prayer never dies. It always remains active. Think about that. The prayers that you pray for your family, for your friends, for your loved ones, they will outlive you. They will outlive you and I. The prayers uh, that we pray for a move of God in this area, an awakening, a revival, they remain active. Prayers that were prayed long time ago over this county, they're still active. Are you hearing me? They never die. They're, in fact, there are locations on this earth right now where there's been moves of God, and there's still what I like to call a residue. Yeah. There's a portal open where you can sense the power of God in that location, in that city, in that place, because prayer never dies. It's almost like this. Once you break, once you break open, once the heavens open over a place, over a city, over a region, it stays open. I mean, it's powerful. I'm, I'm giving you some deep spiritual truth here. That's why our prayer times, Tuesdays on the prayer call, our prayer time here on Wednesdays, prayer time Sunday morning, your prayer times at home praying for the ministry and for this region. What we're trying to do, we're trying to break through the resistance of the enemy. We're not begging God. We're trying to break through the resistance. So the heavens open, miracles, signs, and wonders, people getting born again in the droves. That's what we want. This is not boring stuff. Amen? We're not begging God because you know what? God wants it even more than you and I do. There's a resistance that we have to press through. 
our prayer times are powerful. I take them very seriously. I know, I know you all do as well. But I just wanted to point that, pack, that, that fact out. Um, so you need to get a, get a revelation. When you pray according to the word of God and desire the works of Jesus, I said it a minute ago, I want to hammer it home. Your heavenly father desires to answer those prayers more than we desire them ourselves in our own life. See, now, that's where you got to, it's not, I got to say it again. It's not a matter of begging our Heavenly Father. If it's in His Word, that's His will. Are you following me? His Word is His will. So, for, for people that ain't born again, we're not begging God for it. Right? We're praying. In fact, the, the best way to pray for someone to get born again, are you ready for this? It's not, Lord, let them get saved. Please let them get saved. Jesus said, pray that laborers would be sent into their path. And Jesus even, he, he was saying, if we're not praying for laborers, it's not going to happen. So he's saying, pray for people to be sent in their path, to speak their, the word of God to them. They'll hear the word and they'll get saved. Ooh, so that's how you, that's, that's the right way to pray for someone to get born again. You got a family member that needs to get saved? Lord, send laborers into their path. Let, multitudes of laborers. Let them hear it every day on their job. Let them hear it every day that they're out. Send people. Send them, Lord. Amen. And the implication is if we don't pray for that, people won't be sent into their path, all right? Now, look at Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, look at verse, uh, verses 14 through 16. And uh, it's, so it's not a matter of begging God. It's a matter of believing him, believing his word. It's a matter of this, ready for this? Coming to his throne with boldness. And that's what I want to read here. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. It says this, seeing then, that we have a great high priest, Jesus, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. I like that, confession. We need to speak the word, amen? There's power in speaking the word. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore, here it is, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the, to help in the time of need. Now listen to this, boldly. To come boldly means this. I love this definition. Without reservation. Without delay. With frankness. With full and open speech. You know what that's talking about? Come to him with radical prayers. Be radical with him. Yes. Ask him for things that will blow your natural mind. Yes. Come on, somebody. Amen? Amen? The only way for you and I to come to that throne of grace with boldness is to know who you are in Christ and to know how your heavenly Father sees you. See, if you lack of who, who you are in Christ, if you don't know who you are in Christ, if you don't know how your heavenly father views you, you're, you're going to be timid. You're going to be timid, right? Oh, I can't come. God's too busy for me, right? The lie of the, of the eternal century there, right? God's not too busy. He, he's, a, he's a great multitasker. I found that out. Amen. And, and here it is. Ready for this? We are not servants. Listen, the word of God says that we are sons through faith in Christ. Are you, whoa, hold on here. Let me say that again. It just bounced right back at me, kind of hit me in the eye here. Okay, here we go, ready? <laughs> we are not servants. We are not begging God. We are sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. A servant begs, a son receives. Come on, somebody. This message is from the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, this is one part of it. If we're going to see a move of God, we need radical prayer. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. We are not servants. Let me show you another account that deals with approaching our Heavenly Father. That's a bit misunderstood. Go to Luke chapter 11 with me real quick. 
Luke chapter 11. Meditate on that. On that. The, Jesus said, the glory, Father, that you have given me, I have given them. That's powerful. And now you can see why the devil, one of the biggest things the devil and demons hit in a Christian's life is our identity of who we are in Christ. Because he knows if you get a true revelation of this, there's no chance of him advancing his dark kingdom. Amen? Luke chapter 11, 5 through 10. And it says this. And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give you. I say to you, Though he will not rise to give him because, of, because he is a friend, yet because of his persistence, King James says importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Now, many Christians read that. This is how dead religion spins this, this account. Many Christians read this as if our Heavenly Father is annoyed by our prayers. Oh, really? Christina's coming to me again? Michael, come on, really? Oh, Michael, you're such a drag on me, right? Dave, come on, really? You're going to come to me again, right? 20 times today, right? This is what dead religion has taught us. It's junk. It's rubbish. Are you hearing me? The main point that Jesus is trying to get across is this, the persistence or the boldness. Boldness. It's, it, our Heavenly Father is not that guy who's getting annoyed. Right. The point of this that Jesus was trying to get across was boldness to approach. Boldness and persistence are the exact opposite of double-mindedness, which the book of James warns us about. Amen? Now, Jesus was giving us a couple of points here. Let me keep going. In verse 9, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who, who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Now this is powerful. Jesus was given us three powerful spiritual laws in verses 9 through 10. Let's briefly talk about this. Now, remember, a spiritual law, which I always talk about and I'll continue to until Jesus comes because they're important. A spiritual law is something that can be used for good and it can be used for evil. It's neutral. It's a neutral thing. Are you following me? That's a spiritual law. And Jesus gave us three spiritual laws here. He said, ask, seek, and knock. Now, here's what the Holy Ghost showed me. You ready for this? The three different levels, ask, seek, and knock. Write this down if you're taking notes because this is powerful. So ask deals with your voice. Prayers are worthless. You need to voice this thing. The kingdom of God and the, listen, everything in the spiritual realm is voice activated. Your words are powerful. Our voice opens the door for the kingdom of God to move. Amen? So ask deals with voice. Seek deals with focus. You're focusing on the kingdom of God. You're focusing on what you're praying for. And then um, knock refers to action. Faith without works is dead. So start off with asking. You let your voice, let the command go out. Focus, focus on it. You're praying with someone who has an infirmity or a sickness. Start focusing on seeing the power of God taking that thing away out of their life. Are you hearing me? And then the action is go and pray for them right. or nothing's going to happen. Go lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. Amen? Amen? Jesus literally promised us that if we ask, if we are bold enough to ask, we will receive. And he literally promises us that if we seek, if we focus on him, if we're bold enough to seek, we will find. And that goes for evil too, by the way. Are you following me? Stay away from the evil. And lastly, he literally promises us that if we knock, if we're bold enough to put action to our faith, 
it will be open to us. My goodness. The boldness in prayer is not to talk God into answering you. The boldness, as I said earlier, is to push through the resistance of the enemy. You got, that's, that's a whole, isn't that a whole mind shift of prayer? How many of you who th thought you were trying to talk God into something? Is this not a whole paradigm shift in your thought life right now? It was for me. We're breaking through the demonic and satanic resistance on this earth. I don't know if you know or not, but the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh, uh, flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual darkness on this earth. There is a wrestling match going on. There is a wrestling match. Whether you want to believe it or not, you are in the middle. I'm in the middle right now on this earth. As long as I'm in this earth suit, we're in a wrestling match with the enemy. We have the victory. The only way we lose is if we don't use our authority. If we don't ask, seek, and knock. Amen? So I want to point something out about this. So Jesus talks about boldness and prayer with this account, right? He talks about boldness and prayer right after he teaches about prayer and giving us the model of the Lord's prayer. Look above that, what I just read in Luke 11. So he talks about boldness right after he gives us the model of the Lord's prayer. Now notice I said the model of the Lord's prayer. Jesus was giving us an outline of how to have a successful and powerful prayer life. He wasn't saying to pray it word for word. Right. Now, here's the deal. What, are you saying I can't pray it word for word? No, 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 no. Go ahead and do that. Just know it was a model, an outline that Jesus was giving us. It's not wrong to pray it word for word, but Jesus was teaching us how to pray, not how to say something word for word. Let's go here. Luke 11, 1 through 4. This is powerful. I'm almost done here. Stick with me. Now, it came to pass as he, notice that he's capitalized, talking about Jesus, now, it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also has taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, 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 say. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, you got to put words to your prayers, by the way, okay? So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we also forgive everyone who is, who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I don't know about you, but when I read that in verse one, I am so thankful that one of Jesus' disciples said, Lord, Teach us to pray. I mean, something happened. There was something in Jesus' prayer life that stirred up this man's spirit in such a way that gave him the courage to say to Jesus, uh, Jesus, uh, before we go, can you teach us how to pray? Thank God for that. Amen? My goodness. So here's the deal. Remember back in those days when Jesus in his earthly ministry Back in those days, all that most people knew uh, about prayer and stuff were the traditions of the Pharisees. Are you following me? All they knew is ceremonial and religious kind of things, right? And then, of course, Jesus comes along, the revivalist Jesus, amen? He comes along, and he has this heartfelt, intimate relationship with his heavenly Father, it was different. It had life attached uh, to it. It had authority attached to it. Have you ever been around someone who's praying and you're like, man, their prayer life is amazing. I want what they have. Well, that's, this is what stirred up that disciple. He said, my goodness, Jesus, this is amazing. Something's different here. I'm used to all this boring stuff, but you're bringing in relationship in this thing. You're bringing in an intimacy with this thing. Are you following me? See, this is what our youth, this is what people in dead religion need to come to. Amen? we got to have that genuineness of relationship with our Heavenly Father. So this grabbed a hold of that disciple's heart. 
it wasn't just what Jesus called vain repetition. See, there's a lot, the Pharisees did a lot of vain repetition. Lord, bless me. Lord, Lord. You know, it was just vain. It was vain. It was worthless. Jesus said, you know what? Your heart's not even connected to me. Save your breath. It's worthless. It's all about relationship, right? All right. So in verse 2, Jesus starts out by saying, our Father in heaven. Now, so we are to pray to our heavenly Father. We are to acknowledge him in our prayer life. Jesus was saying. Proverbs 3, 6 says this, acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. Jesus was telling us, when you're praying to your heavenly father, verbally acknowledge him. Heavenly father. Amen? Next is hallowed be your name. We are acknowledging and recognizing that our heavenly father, he is holy. There is none like him. You're verbally declaring this so the devil can hear you. Are you following me, somebody? Oh, come on. There's none like him. It is our verbal declaration that he is above all. We lift no one else or nothing above our heavenly father. All right? So next is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we would meditate on that one verse this week, I guarantee you your faith will into outer space. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Holy Spirit pointed something powerful out to me, a powerful revelation. Are you ready for this? Here we go. Here's another one. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven comes before. Say before. Before Before give us day by day our daily bread. I mean, this is, I was reading this scripture in my office this week. Immediately the Holy Spirit He spoke to me. He goes, I want you to notice what comes first. Oh, my goodness. So here's the deal. Go to Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, comes before. Give us this day our daily bread. Go back, go over to Matthew 6, and let me drive this point home here. It says this. I love it. Jesus is doing the speaking here. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? We have anybody here dealing with any worry, fear, anxiety? You need to hear this word right now. For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. See, if you're seeking those things first, if you're putting your, give us our bread day by day before the will of God being done on earth as it is in heaven, you're, you're no different than the world. You're seeking after things before relationship, before the will of God on this earth. Look at this. For after all these things, the Gentiles or the world seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his way of doing things. Follow the instructions in the book, in other words. And all these things shall be added unto you. If we are seeking first the kingdom of God, Jesus literally promises that all of our needs would be met. If our needs aren't being met, we're not following the instructions in the book. The Holy Spirit told me this. He said, this is the problem. Many Christians flip those two verses around and it short circuits the blessing, favor of God, and power of God from flowing in their lives. Are you following me? Is that not mind-blowing? I've never, see, I've never seen that before. I've never seen that before. That, it was just pointed out to me by the Holy Spirit this week that people are seeking things before the will of God. And he, God clearly said, Jesus clearly said that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things are going to be added unto you. He spoke these words to me after that. He said, tell them to simply follow the instructions in my word and it will keep them in my blessing. It will keep them in my favor. It will keep them in my power. Seeking first the kingdom of God means exactly that. First, make his kingdom, his commands, your relationship with him, your priority in your life. And and, and you know what? You can't fool God. God sees the heart. 
right? We can fool people sometimes, probably most of the time, right? But we can't fool God. So that's why God requires for us to be transparent to him because he says, you fool, I already see your heart anyways. He goes, I just want you to admit where you're at with me. I want you to admit it. Don't try to hide it. That's what Adam and Eve did when they sinned, right? They went and, and put clothes on. They, they realized they were, right? They tried to cover themselves. God says, you fools, you can't cover your sin. I see right through it. So just, you might as well just admit it and let's move on and let him move in power in your life. Amen. Amen. Don't be ashamed. Move on. Move forward. Say, I'm moving forward. I'm moving forward. Now, so I'm on the last page. I'm almost done. Stick with me. All right. What is that? My fourth finish here. Okay, here we go. So Jesus revealed to us to pray the will of God in our prayers. That which is in heaven is the will of God on earth. Remember, I, I talked, I had a ser sermon where I talked about the will, the will of God. Things that are in heaven, that's his will on earth. Is there any sickness, disease, and bondage in heaven? Absolutely not. He does not want it on this earth. Are you hearing me? Is there any lack? Is there poverty? Are there people, right? Kids dying of hunger. Is that happening in heaven? Then it's not his will on earth. Come on, somebody. So his will should be our desire. The word of God is the will of God. Pray the word of God in your prayers. It's powerful. The word of God is the only thing that can build true faith in our life. If you don't have word to back it up, guess what? It's just your opinion then. And you have no, no solid ground to stand on. Are you following me? That's the importance of getting into the word of God. Finding out what God says. What belongs to me through Christ. And go for it. Radical prayers. Amen? Amen. Now next, Jesus told us to pray for our personal needs. After praying the will of God. To pray for our personal needs to be met. So he wants us to be specific in our prayers. Say specific. specific. All right. Jesus told us to pray this. Give us day by day our daily bread. I want you to notice the day by day statement. Evidently, I, I, Jesus expects us to pray every day. Can you believe that? Can you believe he would do that to us? What, we just can't pray, Lord, give me a good year, and then eh, we don't have to pray all year, right? Lord, bless me this year, right? Evidently, Jesus expects us to pray every day. Man, this is some good stuff, amen? Now, it should be our desire to fellowship with our Heavenly Father. Uh, and if it's not, here's what's happening. Our fleshly desires are overtaking our born-again spirit man, all right? That's what's happening. You've got you to fight through that flesh. And let me tell you this. By default, the flesh wins. What do I mean by that? If you do nothing spiritual, the flesh always will win. We have to do something to get in the spirit, to break through the flesh. And part of that is praying, Praying in your English language or your native language and praying in tongues. I'm probably going to do a whole message on, on praying in tongues because it's that important. Are you hearing me? And it's powerful. So, um, so next, Jesus tells us to have, uh, to have a time in our prayer, prayer life to take the time and search our heart to seek forgiveness of sins and to forgive anyone we're holding unforgiveness toward in our life. Have you ever heard anybody say it? Because we operate or we flow in, uh, you know, emotional healing and deliverance ministry, minister to a lot of people. And one of the most common things we hear is when we bring up someone who has unforgiveness towards someone, I can't forgive them. And then I always, and then I'll say to him, not always, but I've said to him, so you're saying God's a liar then, right? God, so you're saying God would require you to do something that you're not able to do? God's not a liar. You are. Are you following me? See, if God commands us to, to forgive someone, it's in our power to do it. God is a just God. He's not going to ask us to do anything that we are incapable of doing. Amen. Unforgiveness, you don't want to go down that road. You don't want to go down that road. You don't want to drop dead with unforgiveness. I'll tell you that right now. Oh, well, God will forgive me, right? Well, I don't want to be a test dummy for it. Are you hearing me, somebody? I don't want to test it out. You know, it, it's, I don't know, whatever. You know, I mean, why would you want to chance it? God says, if you don't forgive, I won't forgive. 
It's you, but one of the main priorities in your life right now, if you're holding on forgiveness or bitterness, you better really seek the Lord and, and make peace in your heart with forgiveness because I, I would not want to drop dead with unforgiveness in my heart. I don't want to be the test dummy. Are you hearing me? So if he requires us to do it, it's possible. All right? I don't care what it is. I know. I mean, the things, the things we hear in deliverance sessions are horrible. Things that a parent has done to a child. or a, You know what I'm saying? These things are horrible. I'm not justifying it. But my goodness, if Jesus, if our Heavenly Father could, could forgive us of all of our junk, right. come on. That's right. Come on. Right. We, we can forgive and move on. And you will have peace in your heart. In fact, all you're doing is keeping yourself in the prison cell. Your unforgiveness, that other person don't care. They're living their life. They're enjoying their life. You hearing me, somebody? They're, they're, your unforgiveness is keeping you in bondage. Don't let the devil do it to you. Amen? Now, um, a failure, a failure to, uh, to search your heart will absolutely hinder the effectiveness in your prayer life. Um, if we're holding on to sin, unforgiveness, like I said, you know what? Save your breath. We're wasting our time. Go deal with your heart first and then come back. Right? All right. So this is another reason why many are discouraged in their prayer life, a failure to search their heart. Let's, let's unclog our heart. Let's put a little spiritual Drano in there. You know what the spiritual Drano is? The Word of God. You need to get the Word of God in there. You cannot read the Word of God or hear the Word of God without something happening because the Word of God is powerful. It's quick. It's like a two-edged sword. It goes in your heart, and it, and it says, oh, I'm, it's going to start chopping things off. Are you hearing me? That's what the Word of God does because it's supernatural. God's trying to heal you. He's trying to bring you into blessing. So you cannot hear, you can, and I guarantee you, you're hearing this message right now, the Holy Ghost, it has a hold of your heart like this right now. Are you hearing me? I love that. Let him work. Let him work, right? We want to see you blessed. We want to see you blessed. Hallelujah. That's my job. I want to, that's what a pastor is. You're trying to lead and guide the people into all truth, right? I want to see you blessed. Come on. We don't want the devil attacking your life. Let's close every door to the enemy. All right? So, uh, oh, and lastly, this is the last point. And lastly, Jesus taught us to pray not to lead us into temptation, but to deliver us from the evil one. The Holy Spirit spoke this to me. He said, many Christians leave this out of their prayer life. And because of that, the enemy is successful in tempting and leading my people into evil. If you would put this one line... Just one little line. Come on. So much junk would be avoided in your life. And doors from the enemy would be shut. So this tells me this. Prayerlessness will cause you to fall into temptation more. Are you hearing me? Prayerlessness will cause you to be led into temptation and not be delivered from the enemy. My goodness. How often do we really add this to our prayer? A very simple one, can, like I said, can avoid attacks from the enemy. Church, know this. There is absolute power in prayer. And when we follow the instructions in the Word of God, we get the results of what the Word of God says. Amen? So let's start praying. Let's get radical in our prayer life here. And let's stretch our faith. And let's watch the Holy Ghost move in power. Let's stand up in this place. Hallelujah. Radical prayer. Say it with me. Radical prayer. Say, my faith is getting radical. My prayers are going to be radical. I'm going to see miracles, signs, and wonders. The power of God loosed in my life, loosed in my family. Everywhere I go, I carry the kingdom of God. Now, maybe there's someone in this place, you're on the outside looking in. You're hearing all this. You've never maybe heard a bold message like this about, about Christianity, about Jesus, about prayer. You just didn't even know it exists because you've been eaten out of the wrong trough. Come on, somebody. 
Woof. Man, that struck a chord right there. You've been eating out of the wrong trough, and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. If that's you, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't leave here without making Jesus the Lord of your life. Here's what's going to happen. If you want to make Jesus Lord of your life, just after service, stand over here, and I want to pray with you to make him Lord of your life. Let's do it. Come on, you don't want to die. You don't want to take your last breath without making Jesus Lord of your life. Now, maybe someone a long time ago, oh, I, I accepted Jesus when I was three years old, when I was four years old. But you know what? If you were in court being convicted of a Christian, you would lose because there's no evidence of it. Come on, somebody. There's no evidence of your salvation. You've totally fallen away. If that's you, I want you to stand over here and let's rededicate your life. And let's settle this thing once and for all. Don't chance your eternity on it. Now, maybe there's someone in here, you've never received the Holy Spirit baptism. That's a second experience after salvation. And if it, Jesus said, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. All right? It's powerful. It will, it, you, can, you will not walk in the power of God, miracles, signs, and wonders, the gifts of the Spirit that we just talked about the last two weeks. You will not do it without the Holy Spirit baptism. If, if that's you, you want to receive the Holy Spirit baptism, meet me over there. Maybe you need a healing. Maybe you need some, just any other prayer for a family member, yourself. Maybe you're one of them that has unforgiveness in your heart towards someone. If you want prayer for that, anything else, I want you to meet me over here, and I'll pray with you. Now, keep in mind, we do have our prayer cloths here. We got, we've been getting, a, we had a testimony that was absolutely amazing. God's working through them. Thank you, Sherry, for making these. They are a blessing. So if you would like to take a prayer cloth for yourself or for a family member, what we do is when you come on up to get it, uh, you lay hands on it, I'll hold on to it, and we're going to pray the power of God, the anointing of the Holy Ghost on this thing, and let's watch God move in power. Amen? Amen. All right, guys. Um, hey, Tuesday night, 7 p.m., the prayer call. Uh, join us. If you need the number, see me or anybody in this church. Uh, we'll get it for you. Uh, Wednesday night prayer, 7 to 8. I'm telling you, radical prayer Radical prayer. And you know what? And I'm, I'm this close. I'm just waiting on the Holy Ghost to say go on the timing of this thing. But I'm getting ready to call the church to some kind of a fast. Some kind of a fast. Because so you can see, so we're talking about radical prayer. And I'm not talking about you, you, where you don't have to eat all day. I'm not, if you want to do that, that's up to you and God. But cutting something out that your flesh is hanging on to. We're going we're gonna to do this. So it, it's coming. It, I'm giving you fair warning, okay? Because... We're talking about prayer, and then you combine fasting with it. Look out. We're going to see a move of God like never before. So, all right, everyone, have a great week. If you need me, give me a call. Get a card in the back. My cell phone is on that. Let's get together. Let's have lunch. Let's, let's chat. Let's, let's see what God's doing in your life. Amen? Amen? All right, guys, have a great week. We love you. Visitors, thanks for coming today. Have a great rest of your week. Well, we'll see you Wednesday. Hallelujah.